Okay, hello and welcome everyone to an event that uh, was supposed to be um, a part uh, in-person, part Zoom event, but turned out to be an all Zoom program, I guess has something to do with the, the chilly weather out there and the icy roads and stuff, maybe, maybe something like that. <laughs> Springs around the corner, folks. Um, at least one can only hope. We are here, I am here at Phoenixville Public Library and pleased to welcome local author, uh, award-winning author, journalist, and local resident, Pamela Gwynn Kripke. I hope I'm saying your last name right, Pam? Yes, that's okay. exactly right. All right, thank you. Um, who is here to discuss her new novel, At the Seams, a novel based on a true story. And she's also gonna talk about her upcoming story collection. Uh, her work has been published in the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Dallas Morning News, Slate, Salon, The Huffington Post, Elle, Red Book, New York, Parenting, and numerous literary magazines. Pamela, we are thrilled to have you with us tonight, and um, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. Sure. So um, I don't know. I don't know if any of you have read the book. I can't can't see all the names um, to know, but um, uh, it base. I, I guess I'll I'll give you a sort of a brief a brief synopsis of what the book is about and uh, um, sort of what happens in it and 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 what uh, some of the themes are that I was hoping to address in it. And then um, I've picked out a few different sections to to read from. So uh, does that sound good? Is that yeah. Okay. So, um, so basically, it's it's a coming of age story about a uh, precocious little girl, Kate, who has to figure out what to do with her innate curiosity and instinct uh, in a family that has a uh, tendency to resist certain realities. So she, um, plot wise, she her, her mom tells her when she's eight years old that um, her grandfather, grandparents had a, um, a baby, a newborn, um, before her mom, who dies in the hospital mysteriously and in a way that uh, would be disturbing to anybody, let alone a, uh, an, an eight-year-old girl, or there are rumors of, of what happened. And she's also told that she can't talk about it. So she has this crazy news, this disturbing, tormenting kind of vision in her head, but she can't ask questions. She can't go to the grandparents. She can't ask her parents because they don't want the poor grandmother to be upset. So uh, she deals with, um, she basically has to figure out how to make sense of this dynamic and, um, and uh, whether to contest the secrecy surrounding the situation and then also to address the situation on her own. Um, so, uh, I've broken the, the book up into, into three, three parts. So she's in the first part, she's an eight year old girl dealing with this news. And, and then she's a 16 year old in the second part where she has a little bit more agency over, over what's going on. Uh, and, um, and then in the third part, she's a, 40 year old single mom who has her own daughter. And uh, she's also a reporter who, who um, investigates the, the details of, of, of the event. Um, so basically, I, you know, I hope to address um, issues of generational patterns. The grandfather in the book is a dressmaker. He's actually a pattern maker, makes clothing. He makes patterns for lots and lots of dresses. So. It's his idea to keep everything hush hush to protect the grandmother, um, and this sets up a pattern of behavior of secrecy. And um, so there, there's that. There's also um, the notion that you have these patterns of behavior, and and to shake them um, um, is difficult. And and uh, there's also a cost to that, uh, which is what Kate Kate is figures out. Um, as she as she grows up, she also hears about some other secrets along the way that uh, intensify this whole uh, problem that she has. Um, it's also a little bit about um, um, the permission to have um, these feelings. The grandmother is not really allowed to grieve. Um, um, it's it's thought that she's being protected, but really this this 
ability to have the feeling she has has kind of taken away from from her and that how it happens in elsewhere in the book too um and then um there's uh let's see five mothers in the book so five generations there are these three and then there's also a great grandmother and then kate has her own uh daughter so um you know it's it's about motherhood and this maternal need to protect the child um and you know what that protection looks like is different uh, for for each person. Um, so basically, it, it and you know it, all in all, it has to do with loyalty to fam to family. Um, and she has to figure out well, how does she be loyal as an obedient, dutiful child? How how can she be loyal to her family and also to herself and her beliefs and ultimately to the truth? So. Um, that's in essence what what the what the book is about, and uh, it comes from. Um, there's a lot of truth in it. Um, this this um, the baby would have been my uncle in real life, and um, um, and I was told this this story when I was little, um, um, and and I was also told not to not to upset grandma. <laughs> so. Um, it didn't obsess me in the way that it obsesses Kate. So I, I took that and I thought to really heighten the experience for a different kind of a kid, someone who who might really internalize to the point where it affected her her life and her school and her behavior and her fears and um, um, to the point where she is conflicted about what to do. And um, and I also did investigate it in real life as a reporter grown up. And so, um, so a lot of the, the details of what I found out in real life were, were not known to my family um, because it was hushed, no one investigated. And um, um, so I could only go so far with it because there are only so many details available. It's about 80 years ago. So um, I fictionalized what I couldn't figure out from documenting and interviewing. So, so there's some of that in there. So there's a real mix of, you know, truth and, and fiction in it. So, you know, feel free to jump in with questions anytime. <laughs> but, um, so I thought I'd read uh, from the first part. Uh, this is a little scene, um, I guess it's about a week or so after Kate hears about the baby and they go visit the grandparents. The grandparents live about 45 minutes away and they routinely go and visit on the weekends. Okay. And Ben is the brother and Evie is her mom. Okay. That night, Ben and I were going to sleep in the den on fold out couches. I said that I was tired and went into the room early before my brother. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I opened the drawers of my grandfather's desk and flipped through papers and composition notebooks and folders tied with string. I pulled open cabinets and found Frank Sinatra records and old bottles of liquor wearing tuxedo vests to soak up the drips. In a closet, I saw a stack of photo albums, each one four inches thick. I dragged two off the shelf and sat on the floor. My heart sped. Maybe there was a picture tucked away or a tiny hospital bracelet sliced for removal from a tiny wrist pressed flat. I turned the pages seeing my grandparents blow out candles and drink daiquiris, pose in front of Radio City, eat corn on the cob. They smiled for the camera, sparkly, full of life. I opened another book and saw my mom, about my age at the time, on a sidewalk with her grandmother, Beatrice, who used to come on the bus in a long black dress and dance when she stepped onto the pavement. She came most days, but the joy didn't wear off. The den door creaked and I quickly gathered the heavy books and pushed them back onto the shelf. You have to see this one, Grandma Lily said, placing two extra blankets on a chair. She stood on her toes and reached an ivory album. It's Evie, the first time we took her to the beach. Look how beautiful. My mother was in a carriage, a sailor hat square on her head. Grandma Lily traced her fingers over the stroller around its big white wheels. She looks like Ben did, I said. Grandma Lily put a finger on my mother's cheek. She does. She looks just like him. And the, the him in that is referring to um, the, the, the baby. But, but Kate doesn't, doesn't understand that at the time. 
and and later on in the chapter um, they they leave they stay for the weekend on sunday my father timed our departure so he wouldn't get caught in traffic he had to be at the hospital at seven the next day and mom also had an early start in the classroom sunday nights were for preparing they were serious my hair was wet from the outside shower when we got into the car and my skin was still hot from the sun the beach does that to you, mixes up your senses, distorts time. Grandma Lily gave us a shopping bag filled with turkey sandwiches, pickles, and peaches. Combined with the linger of suntan lotion and salt air, the aroma was nothing that could be duplicated anywhere else at any other time. Grandma Lily and Papa Sam stood on the sidewalk and waved as we pulled away from the curb. Just a couple of inches taller, my grandfather rocked on his toes, one hand over her head, the other around Lily's shoulder. I swiveled around and waved back out the rear window until I couldn't see them anymore. If we got caught as, um, at the light on the corner, I could watch them turn and go up the steps. That Sunday, I saw Papa Sam hug Grandma Lily at the front door, and they stayed like that, her head on his chest, until the light turned green. Everything they said or did now, every look, every motion, had new meaning. Was an extra embrace at the door meant to ease the sadness? Was a funny remark meant to distract, a complimentary one intended to compensate? Had their entire existence, their course, their personas been transformed by tragedy? Did I not know who my grandparents truly were? Okay. So the second section I'd like to read is, um, is at um, Kate's sweet 16 birthday party. And her, her grandfather designs a dress for her and sends it in the mail. They kind of design it together and it arrives. And she has a crush on a boy named Charlie Rogers. Okay, let's see. Weeks before the party, mom had projected a photo of my face onto a huge square canvas and traced the key features, filling in the lips with red paint and the eyes light brown. My friends wrote flattering and inspirational messages to me in the background. I'm so glad you sat next to me in Mademoiselle Stone's French class. You are destined for success, except for the Morris twins who signed their names on my cheeks, Tommy on one side, Timmy the other. The inscriptions looked like sutures if you stood back a couple feet a lucky slashing victim, or a bout with cystic acne, post-op. Charlie Rogers entered with little fanfare, slipped in, hands in his pockets. Nothing beats a navy sport coat kicked back by pocketed hands. I started to count before crossing the room and greeting him, despite my position as hostess, which nullified the need to delay for cool's sake, for I don't have a crush on you's sake. As hostess, I was supposed to be enthusiastic and welcoming. I was supposed to hurry right over and smile and usher him inside. Greet every guest and take the coats my father had taught me when I turned three. And at the end, show them out. They should never leave by themselves. Before anyone came or went, he swept the porch. I checked myself in a mirror and walked toward Charlie. He looked at my dress when he saw me. Thanks for coming. Did you get a ride with Dan? His hair, longish and parted on the side, was damp. He had showered within the hour. He had to do something first, so I got dropped off, but he'll be here pretty soon. Well, come in, everyone's almost here. I detected a botanical scent, maybe a cucumber. Cool, he said, taking a gift from his jacket pocket. You look really nice, by the way, and this is for you. My sister picked it out. If I had the ability right then to assess our exchange, I may have noticed several significant, if not startling indications. First, he looked at my body and later commented positively about it. Second, he chose to come on his own without Dan, a decision that could reasonably imply that he did not want to be late. Third, he showered. And fourth, his choice and gift was meaningful enough to him that he enlisted his sister's help. Certainly, a person might enlist his sister's help if he did not care what was contained in the box or want to spend his time hunting for it. But unless he had malicious intent or was a passive aggressive narcissist, he wouldn't divulge this lack of interest to the giftee, I wouldn't think. Of course, I made none of those, uh, these observations at the precise moment of our meeting at the party door, distracted as I was by the flung back sport coat and wafts of cucumber pulsing from his locks. To me, he was a boy I liked, not one who liked me back. We walked into the room and I peeled off. James Taylor drifted from the speakers. 
During the course of the party, I kept an eye on Charlie from afar as I was in the habit of doing. Something seemed different though across this room beyond my dressed up friends and pink plaid tablecloths. I sensed that it was possible that Charlie Rogers could actually feel something for me too. And this time I didn't cast off the thought. Was 16 an age to be daring, bold, to believe in one's potential? Or is being the center of attention merely going to my head momentarily, like a coma victim who pops back into lucidity for a precious visit, only to regress? I found Annette by the buffet. I think he's going to ask you to dance. You do? When? She turned around and spotted him. Soon, within minutes. Just be available and don't run away. Oh God, do I look away? Do I look okay? The prettiest ever. Meantime, I spun around the dance floor with the other boys, none of whom made my belly flutter or tongue flop. The party was to end at 11 and it was 9.30. Stealthily, I perused the perimeter of the room, failing to find Charlie anywhere. He wouldn't have left, but could he have meandered down the hallway or gone outside, bored? Oh God, Kate, confidence, you're 16. He might even like you. The song ended and a slow one kicked in. The boys made quick exits and I turned to walk off the dance floor too. I love this song, come on. Charlie Rogers appeared in front of me, his Oxford sleeves rolled up, tie loosened. In seconds, his hand curved around my waist, feeling firm but not stiff. His fingertips pressed into my back. I lifted my arms to his shoulders, glancing into his eyes and looking away. We stepped side to side, swaying, air between us. It felt that I was smiling too much, so I tried to rein in my lips, tensing them at the edges. The party's really fun, he said. I liked the drawing. Thanks, my mom traced it from a photograph. It looks like you. I decided that it was not cucumber, but something woodsy like pine or cedar. He stepped closer. Then he took one of my hands and raised it, turning me underneath in a slow pirouette and reeling me back in. Wait, you take dance, right? I nodded. He spun me again two times. I bet you can do a million of these. He moved his hands higher up my back. My muscles softened, my breaths deepened, my chest grazed his. The room turned around me, a carousel, a blur, anchored by random images, clear pictures that reminded me where I was. The birthday cake frothing in flowers at three o'clock. Susie Harmon chatting up a group of girls at six. Ben at nine, flirting with Mimi Greenhouse. At one of the corners of the dance floor, my family sat at a table. Angie had come too, along with friends of my parents, a couple they had known for years. I lifted my fingers off of Charlie's shoulder and waved to Grandma Lily but we turned before I could see her response. On the next revolution, I expected her to be ready, to make some encouraging motion in reply, to fold her hands in front of her chin and cock her head, to bend an elbow and rock back and forth. Mimicking, mimicking, our, mimicking our slow two-step, sharing in my first welcome encounter with a boy, as she was still the only person I spoke with about such things. I waved again, but she didn't react. She gazed straight at me, seeming to see me, but not acknowledging it. She was calm, her eyes were flat. I lifted my hand again, moving it side to side with more strength, more speed, pushing the air, clearing the dust. Charlie pressed his head chest against mine. My skin receptors, already on high alert, drank in the stimuli. I must have lit up red, a neon sponge soaked with the stuff of attraction, the elation, the separateness, the hope. On the third turn, Grandma Lily repositioned herself in the chair, eradicating me from her line of sight. Papa Sam leaned to tell her something and then stood. It appeared methodical, familiar. I gripped Charlie's shirt, pulling the cotton into my palm. He lowered his head and his hair skimmed my cheek. The space between us shrank and grew warm. Too soon, the song wound down. Our movement slowed. He released me and stepped back. Grandma Lily's seat was empty. Charlie Rogers' face was flush. I smoothed out my lavender organza, a parachute landing soft, cooler air kissed my skin. There was not to be, I was beginning to see, the beauty of one blissful sensation felt singularly without interruption. There would be a pairing, an undeniable coupling of competing emotions, exhilaration and worry, anticipation and fear, love and despair. One would not happen without the other. I stood on the dance floor, feeling life's wicked tug, realizing the weight of choosing of responding to one or the other, and also the importance of savoring the good. I want to sign your picture, Charlie said. He took my hand and led me to the easel. Let's see how are we doing on time? Okay. Oh, 
We're fine. We're fine. Um, can I ask, ask a question about a typical librarian question <laughs> yeah. about how you got your uh, book published? Um, you know, what the process was, how long it took and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, I um, let's see, I, I wrote, I finished, was writing it during the pandemic year. So during 2020 and um, sent it around to a bunch of um, small literary presses and that it took a while, you know, they take months to read. So um, I guess, you know, six to eight months of, of, you know, just sending and waiting. And then um, the first one who, who said, yes, I said, yes. <laughs> and then, and then you go about contacting the others to withdraw the, the manuscript. So they don't take, you know, you don't want them to take all the time if they don't, if you've already signed with someone else. So, and it, it came out in, um, I guess the end of April, 2023. And so, and so it was about, I guess, like six months or so once, once they accepted it, it was pretty, pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. And it did attract uh, the attention of uh, Midwest Book Review, I see. Uh, so it, you got it out there, which is great. Of course, your, your work is known in all those publications too. So I'm sure that helped. Uh, that helps. It's, yeah. it's still very hard. You know, the small presses don't get, they, they don't have the publicity teams that the, the, bigger ones okay. have it, it's hard it's hard you know it's it's it, it's harder because they don't they can't get it in front of too many people and 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 uh um you know it's 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 difficult but within the literary circles it's gotten some nice notice so there's a, a story in, in um i think philadelphia stories is gonna run a, a piece about it and um uh, literary mama which is another um literary publication uh, women writing about motherhood um, just did a, a a little interview the other day, and so it's gotten some nice, you know, press like that. But, Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Pamela. There's a couple of people that have their uh, hands raised. I think we'll go to uh, Donna. I think you had her your hand up first. Go ahead, Donna. You can unmute. Hi, um, and thank you for for doing this. Um, I was curious. Um, there is a lot of mystery around the events and um, I was wondering if you had any reservations or pushback from your family. Oh, um, well, uh, not really. Um, you know, I have, I have one brother and, and, and he, um, um, you know, he, he knew what I knew about this, you know, it wasn't something that was present, very present in our lives growing up. We knew about it. It was just sort of a fact that this happened. Um, and my, my mom you know, suffers from some memory issues. So she, she, you know, she hasn't read the book. She's not able to. So, um, um, I wrote about this one. I, I did some initial research a, a, a while ago and, and wrote a piece for the Huffington Post based on just discovering the details of the baby, um, that the baby existed, that he, and I, I found the death certificate. I found um, his name. No one knew his name even, um, um, or the days that he lived, um, or and any of the details about the hospital. Um, so at that time, I, I, you know, my mom read, read the story then, um, she was, she was fine then. And, and she was interested to know, um, the details, but, but it was, it was for me peculiar because, um, it was very matter of fact to her. And, uh, you know, and she said, you know, there was no, she was raised as an only child and there was no discussion about the baby. There was no awareness in her household growing up. It was she was the only child with two doting parents. Um, so it wasn't like he existed for her. So she really wasn't all that curious. She she um, when I told her the name, she thought, oh, that makes sense. Um, but I also discovered uh, a couple other things. I discovered that my grandmother had another brother. So my mother had an uncle who died in the war when he was 18, that uh, no one, you know, she did not know about that. Um, 
so, so uh, you know, she was raised protected from, from the knowledge. And, you know, and, and that protection, you know, you could say, well, it was so much that it made her unfeeling about this, you know, but um, you can't, you know, it's not anything to judge. It was just how they chose to take this information and raise their child, you know. And then I guess because it was no big deal in her head, it was no big deal for her to tell me as, as a child, you know. But so I wanted to explore, well, what if it was a big, it became a big deal for the child? And obviously it stayed with me. So, it, it, you know, unlike my mom, it stayed with me in some way such that when I grew up, I wanted to investigate, you know. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, families back then tended to have more more secrets than they do in the uh, today's uh, information age. Uh, hard to keep things like that. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cass, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. I do, and I appreciate this very much, um, Pam. Thank you. Sure. So Donna asked one of my questions, and. I have a few, but let's just start with one. Um, from the time that you made a decision or came closer to to making the decision of finding out more uh, and then starting to dig into it, I'm thinking you have a very, and being a reporter methodically, um, how is it emotionally for you? Right, right. Yeah, it um, it was more emotional for me than than for my mom. You know, um, it it you know, and and another aspect of it was that when I first started um, looking into it after all these years, I, I had two little two little kids, and um, I was divorced, newly divorced, and the first time that my daughters went to stay with their father over the weekend. My younger one becomes hysterical in the car. And this is a scene in the book. And um, something in that in real life triggered me. And I didn't know at the time, but that time period um, was when I started thinking about my grandmother's baby. So there was some connection with, you know, loss of a baby and, you know, uh, a baby being taken from you, basically. I mean, they're different, but a loss um, for, bo for both involving babies. <laughs> and um, that's when I subliminally was thinking about my grandmother's baby. And um, so, so yeah, so it, it's affected me probably in ways that I wasn't aware of, you know. Um, when I, I, um, I contacted the, um, I guess, the Department of Records in New York and um, and, uh, they said, well, we'll see what we can do. And, um, about a month later, I, I get a letter in the mail, New York board of records, and it's the, um, death certificate and which I couldn't find and it had all of these details and it had the name. And when I saw the name, um, and it had the, you know, date of birth, date of death, and it had a doctor's signature, it had, um, it had, uh, I guess, for cause of death, it listed, um, it listed, I guess, medical findings. It, it didn't say such and such happened to cause X, Y, and Z. Just X, Y, and Z um, were listed. Um, so, so that I remember. And I, I lived in Texas for for a long time, and I, you know, I'm sitting there in Texas reading this at my desk. And that, you know, made it, made it real, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll go into one more question. Um, you've already said that there were really no objections and your mom was kind of emotionally numb to the thing, to the whole mm -hmm. occurrence. And that's a whole nother, right. you know, that's a whole nother book you've got. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, but you it's interesting your your little son going hysterical and it was like boom yeah uh, for you 
That's an yeah. interesting thing right there. Yeah, and, and I didn't realize that and, and until, you know, I questioned that when I, re, you know, in 2020, when I was, when I was writing this, I, I looked up some of my old notes and I found the old, um, the old uh, death certificate and, and I, and I looked at the dates of when I wrote the story for the Huffington Post. And, and I know that that came after, you know, I didn't write it right away. Um, and I look back at the dates and then I, and then I figured out my kids ages and I realized it was very close to that. It was in that year, in that period of time. So I, I wasn't even aware until recently. When you were writing the book, Pam, did you also find, this is my last year, just, you're oh, very interesting because you'll you'll answer and then you go right into what I was thinking. So okay. thank you for that. When you decided on that drive really to, to begin delving into it, how long uh, was that to when you actually put pen to paper? And while putting pen to paper, did you find at portions you needed to just take a break because you were you need, you know, as a writer, we either can separate from that so we can write it or we. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I had um, some of the initial reporting done years ago for the Huffington Post piece. And, and then when I started up again, I, I sort of redid and I tried to go in a lot of other directions. So I originally set out to write it as a memoir. And so I, um, I tried to track down you know, you know, the hospital and the documents and and, and um, relatives of, of of people in the town who could have been daughters, sons, and nieces of nurses, you know, who may have worked there. So so I tried all of those those routes to finding people to to speak with and um, and the, that reporting sort of it was a lot of you know rabbit holes and a lot of dead ends, and so I would stop. You know, and then once I decided to turn it into fiction, then then um, I just went with it. But there was a little stop start with the reporting until I figured out, well, what can I do with this? Because I can't write it as a memoir because there are key things that that might be missing. You know. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. And Susan has her hand raised. Susan, go ahead. Hey, Pam, thank you. This is terrific. Um, having the benefit, I must disclose to others that I have, I know Pam and I have heard Pam speak before, but each time it's novel and wonderful. And I have questions I didn't have before. And one of them is you talk about how you started thinking it would be a, a memoir. And obviously you had reasons why it really didn't shape that way because of access to information and so forth. My first question is, were you disappointed it couldn't be a memoir? Or were you actually, was a part of you secretly relieved because you could take license and have some agency with some of the details that either you didn't want to be uh -huh. particularly accurate to what had happened or more importantly for your style of writing mm -hmm. that's a great question susan <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, at first, you know, I had never, I, I had written um, short stories at that point, but I had never written a full novel. Um, and and um, so I was familiar with writing, you know, fiction, short fiction, and um, enjoyed that very much. Um, I, you know, it, it's funny, I was in a way disappointed that I couldn't pursue it as a memoir because, um, you know, as a journalist, it's, it's you 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 want to you want to find the answers to things, and that was in my head to sort it all out and figure it all out and 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 piece it together and find out definitively this happened. You know, so um, 
you know, the fact that I don't know the exact cause of death irks me. You know, I, I can make a, you know, and I spoke with physicians about, you know, this, you know, what, what the chances are that this could have happened or this could have happened. Um, um, so yeah, you know, when you don't have, you know, a black and white answer to things, it's, it's, it, you know, that you wanted to have, it's, 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 you know, it, 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 it can be disappointing on a certain level. Um, but I also knew that, you know, this is a story that, you know, I wanted to tell and I couldn't tell it that way. So I was happy to be able to tell it um, in some way. Mm -hmm. Plus it, um, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, it wasn't so dramatic in real life in, ter in terms of the, you know, since it was Kate's story, Kate had to have more of a, um, um, more going on in her life with her relationships with her parents and, and, and she didn't really have that. So, so I think it made a better, I think it made a better um, novel, a better work of fiction because um, with her at the center of it, because she didn't have in real life the tension with the parents and the other secret that sort of adds fuel to the story. Um, so yes, it, you know, it, it did allow the story, the themes of the story to be heightened and maybe the point, point to, points to be revealed, you know, uh, more strongly. Um, so if that's a yes or no, it's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Um... I apologize that I'm not on video, but I'm on an iPad and I'm technologically challenged and my tech support has left and I can't figure out how to turn on the video. So apologies to all. Just a follow up question. At what point did you decide to write this work of fiction through the lens of Kate as opposed to one of the other prominent characters. Yeah. So, so I, th I thought that I would write it at first. I thought I would write, and I think the journalist in me thinks in chunks, you know, we think in, in, in shorter, shorter chunks of writing. So I was thinking, well, it's a story about motherhood and, and the maternal need to protect, and it's about generations. So I thought that I would write it in three parts with the first part being the Lily story and the second part, Eva, the mother, and the third, Kate. Um, but then I realized that Kate was connected to both and Kate could, could um, there really wasn't enough to say. She had most to say in, in that she could see it both ways and she was feeling the impact of the generational story at the bottom of the list, uh, the youngest. So I thought to, to, to make it her story. Um, and so that way the characters could be carried through. Yeah. That's so interesting because in many ways, was that you personally in real Sorry. life? In many ways, was that you personally in real life? Were you, I'm Kate? To... Are you, oh, was Kate? I Kate? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I am a, a real watered down Kate. So Kate is a is a um, is a, um, a dr very dramatic me. So I was I um, didn't do all the things that that Kate did in the book. Um, she runs away. I never ran away. Um, but she has. But the... you considered it. Sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, yes, she would be, if, if I did everything I thought to do, it would be Kate. So I That's was such a great Kate. answer. I, I wish I had this talent to be able to write about all the things that I would have been in a fictional uh -huh. character if I had felt I had agency to be and to do. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, my pleasure, Suze. <laughs> Looks like Donna, you have another question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, and I'm and I'm sorry if I, I missed it if you've already mentioned it. My dog was fussing behind me. Um you I see from your website you have a um short story collection coming out. Yeah. Um 
do you prefer which one did you enjoy more writing short stories or the longer uh novel yeah you know I think you know, and it's just, okay to say you know I like both they're just different <laughs> yeah they're yeah they're they're different you know I I like the the short form just because for 30 years I've been writing you know stories that are 2000 words long. So it's, it's comfortable. I just, I, I feel like I feel the pace of that. You know, it's a very natural length. Um, you know, you, you kind of just know it's muscle memory. You kind of know when things need to happen in terms of, you know, where you are in the stories so that feels comfortable. I, you know, so the idea of writing something longer is a challenge that is also exciting. Um, and, and so, you know, I like the idea of, of basically taking a short story and then stretching it out. Um, it, you know, it, you know, it's just as much work, if not more work to write the collection because each, each piece, there are 21 stories in it and each one is its own beginning, middle and end and unique character and situation and, 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 um, but um, I really enjoyed both. You know, I, I'm working on a no another novel next. So, um, yeah, something a little, little lighter, a little, um, little less angsty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. Terrific questions, everyone. Thanks so much for the engagement yeah. here. Um, anyone else have anything? And feel free to type in the chat if you don't want to unmute. And uh, Pamela, can you just tell people where they can uh, get your uh, book and tell uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, short story collection that's coming up? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you can find the book, you know, Amazon or you know, bookstores will order it, or um, Amazon is the easiest um, and you know, easily found. Um, the short story collections is is um, on pre-order now. So you can get it from the publisher. Um, and it's it, the link is on my website. So my website is just my name, PamelaGwynnKripke.com. And on the first page, there's a little description of, of it. And there's a, a link where you can pre-order it. The publisher's name is Open Books, which is a literary publisher. And their um, website is open-bks.com. Um, so yeah, so, so, um, so that's where you can find it. And that's due to come out the end of March. So yeah. And, um, what's the it, title? Oh yes. The, the title is, and then you apply ice. And it's a collection of stories about, um, all women protagonists or women figure prominently. And, and basically it's, you know, you, things happen to you and you, you know, you slap some ice on it, you get up and you, 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 you limp along. So it's, it's about, um, um, transgressions and, um, disappointments and, you know, what women do to, you know, get up and go after, whatever it may be. And yeah, you know, quirky situations, all kinds of things, you know, that are you know, pretty common, common daily kinds of, uh, of experiences. Um, all kinds of women, young, old, middle-aged, kids, adolescents. I have a story I, I have, I could read if you'd like from it. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. I really love the color, the cover of the, the short story book. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, you know, some of the stories are, are funny. They're, they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're poignant. They're funny. They're, you know, I think a lot of people could relate. This one um, is called Matchbox. Okay. And they're all different lengths too. Sometimes I wonder what would happen if Brad's wife died. 
Early, I mean, not when she became old. It is a terrible thought, I know, but the idea enters my head anyway. It's not that I wish for this to happen, for her to engage a parasite on an overseas trip, or suffer a stroke, or careen down a mountain on a scooter, because who would ever wish that for another person, particularly someone loved by the person you loved, or love, who knows which. Brad told me in one of our phone calls during my divorce that had he not been married, we could be a pair within seconds, nanoseconds. So I think about his being married and what an annoyance that is. Other times, I think that I just that I will just wait until his wife does die at the natural time, the older time. This is the more respectable way to think, and I feel like a better person thinking about it like this, though it does present an enormous swath of time in which to twiddle one's thumbs. Brad and I will be 90, maybe. She is good stock, hearty, and athletic of her body, I can tell from the holiday cards. At 90, we will combine households, share toasting ovens and fingertip towels. We will set up framed photos of our children on bookshelves and mantles. We will walk to town wearing hats. We will be old, but we'll not think that we are. Meantime, my friend Sally wants me to go on a date with a man she knows. She says that he is the kind of man whom I would like honest, brainy, handsome. Who wouldn't like a man like that? I know that, I know though, that even honest, brainy, and handsome men have needs and wishes that require attention from a woman, should that woman decide to have more to do with him than have a cob salad in a restaurant. I am too busy waiting for Brad to deal with all of that, a meal, a second date, an intermingling of any kind. And I think that even talking with this man would simply be unprincipled. Sally says that I should just I should go and just have the salad. This is not a moral decision, she tells me. Sally works with men and farms them out to her friends who actually want to meet them. Plenty of women want to do this. After the fourth time that she mentions it, I agree to go out with the man, Alan. My daughters also urge me to go out with Alan. I'm thinking that they, as teenagers, think that it will be amusing for them if I go through with it, though they insist that the date will be good for me, whatever that means good, insane term. And wear a dress, Sally says. A what? The man has a stunning and tiny car. I can see through the window. Not that I care about cars or know about them. But this one is like a baby toy. I don't know how I will fit, and I am quite small. I open the front door. Hello, I say, noting the tan dress pants. Man pants at a moment squealing for khakis. Julia? No, Susanna, wrong house. I can't figure out how to get into the tiny car. It feels as if I should go head first, like a dive from the side of a pool. I am an incompetent swimmer, and I dive only from the side of a pool, never off the board where the earth sats. I put my left foot on the floor, but think it is an unwise stretch from my right anterior cruciate ligament and draw it back onto the curb. Alan waits, holding open the door. I smell gardenias or jasmine coming from his torso, and a heavy dose at that. One summer, I had a job selling men's accessories in a department store and had with many a sample vial of cologne while no one bought accessories. Alan's scent may have been a hybrid. One sec, I say, switching my bag to my other hand and shifting my weight. Sit first, he says. Oh, assistance. Then swing your legs in. I am tempted to end the date there, bent in half, my rear end searching for the seat. I hold on to the roof and the armrest and feel the surface underneath me, finally, grabbing with my third hand onto my head for cover. Fortunately, I don't take Sally's sartorial suggestion and instead wear jeans. Alan shuts the door and walks around to the driver's side. Positioned so close to the pavement, I can see his calves through the window. In one choreographed and well-honed movement, he curls and swivels his tall body into the seat, contracting involuntarily like a jellyfish or a Martha Graham dancer. To look at him and his ample midsection, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think he'd be able to fold himself and enter his own tiny car so effectively. He must have been hailed to reduce his girth, taken a huge breath on the street before crumpling up. He grabs the wheel, flashing a weighty gold watch and teeth to match his snowy locks. He does have pretty teeth, I must say. You all set, he asks. I balance my purse on my knees and do not answer his question. My nails are painted the same pink as Brad's wife's nails are in the New Year's card. I determine the aroma to be the gardenia, after all, the flower of the mafia. The engine revs up, and instantly the microscopic car zips out onto this street. The world seems cockeyed from the passenger seat. My neighbor's house looks purple and misshapen, a home for fairies. 
the oak canopies now make faces and reach at me. This will be my one and only date with Alan, the Alan who is not Brad, I decide by the end of the block, not even the end of the block. Thank you, Pamela. Appreciate that. Okay. Any comments, questions from anyone else? It was a fun story, says Cindy. Definitely yeah. unique. I've, I'm uh, a member of several writers groups, and I'm a writer, and so I hear a lot of you know, we all share our stories that have been published or we're working on, and that's a really unique angle, <laughs> kind of oh, that's Brad yeah. and his wife. And and I was wondering, you know, she'll pass away and you'll both be old and you went right into the 90, we'll be 90 years old. Yeah. Very, and, you know, I, I think people think stuff like that, but they, they, you know, they don't really say it. So, you know, that's, I think one of the goals of, Writing is to to say the things that 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 uh, people think about, but you know don't really explore. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Well, please keep uh, me posted on your uh, publications and. Thank you. Uh, we, we do have at the seams here at Phoenixville Library, and there's one other library in the county system that has it too. I uh, would okay. like to get uh, any more that you've had. Uh, so continued success with uh, your work. And Thank thanks you. everybody again for joining us tonight and your wonderful questions and engagement Thank with you. our author, Pamela. Pamela, thank you again. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Appreciate right. it. Good thank night you. now. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.